are in our continually, uh, continual uh, study in the book of Re- Revelation. And the question of the series, the title of the series is, Are You Ready? And we want to make sure that we are going to be ready uh, for when Jesus Christ comes back. And so last week we talked about hell. So we got to do the flip side of the coin. This week we're going to talk about heaven. All right? Is that cool? We're going to talk about heaven. Now, when I was a kid, I, w- I grew up and went to Sunday school. How many of you grew up and went to Sunday school or something like that? Maybe you uh, went to confirmation or something like that. Okay, so when I went to Sunday school, they told stories, uh, Bible stories, using what was called a flannel graph, all right? Flannel graph. They are, they're, they're, it's basically Bible characters cut out on felt, and they'd stick it to this board, all right? And so the, you know, the, the, the Sunday school teachers, they'd be telling a story, usually of the Israelites going through the, the, the deserts of Egypt in their way to the promised land. And so you'd see these guys with their robes and their sandals and their camels going through a massive desert in sand dunes, all right? It, is anybody resonating with this? Is this is, do you remember this? Some of you are shaking your head yes. If you didn't, okay, then, then good for you. All right, so anyway... Uh, Sorry if you love the flannel graph. You can get them cheap on eBay. But anyway, this is the way that we did technology back in the day. And so it was like these, you know, these guys just kind of like this. And, you know, and Paul said, and then then, then move it to the other side of the flannel graph. It was just, it was interesting. And so as I saw these stories time and time and time again, I got somewhere in my head, I came to the understanding that heaven is going to be us just meandering around the desert on sand dunes and a robe and sandals. And I remember telling my parents, like, hey, I, I know the Bible answer, the right answer is to say that I want to go to heaven, but I think I just want to stay home and play Nintendo. I like the clothes that I wear. I don't have to wear these sandals and robes. You know, I, I just, I, I kind of like our way of life here. And so I had this distorted view of heaven as a kid. You know, it doesn't just take kids having a distorted view of heaven. Uh, For many, we have bought in the depiction of heaven uh, where when you die, you sit on clouds and you play harps while an opera is like, and you're playing the little harp and like, oh yes, we're playing music for Jesus, right? Like on your little cloud. How many of you have seen that depiction or you believe that depiction, okay? Yeah, right? That doesn't sound like heaven. That sounds like last week's uh, subject on hell, all right? Like, like if, if I'm like, okay, literally we're gonna be on a cloud playing a harp, uh-uh, right? Well, guess what? That is, I don't know whose depiction of that, maybe Michelangelo or someone who depicted a painting, I don't know. We have a lot of misconception of what heaven is, and as a result, many of us, if we are really, really honest this morning, we're not really excited to go there. We're like, okay, I'd rather go there than, you know, you know, swim in a pool of fire for the rest of uh, all of eternity. And so it's preached in culture today as a result of our non-excitement for eternity that what's going on in your life right now is of utmost importance. Your possessions, your home, your car, your 401k, your relationships, your, your, your friendship circles, what, what could happen in the future. Uh, it's preached throughout culture that you need to do what you want to do do you, this whole month's about do whatever you want to do, right? Okay, it's like, hey, be happy. But what we know is this, is that the culture preaches empty promises because when you receive that thing that says it's gonna make you satisfied, you need more of it to keep satisfied or you get tired of it and you look for something else. Happiness is fleeting depending upon your circumstance and your feelings are deceptive. One of the enemy's greatest strategies is to downplay heaven as if it's a downgraded earth experience. We tend to only think of heaven in earthly terms as if our rewards in heaven are just a better version of things we possess on earth. Oh, I can't wait to get my golden motorcycle, right? Oh, I can't wait to get my golden mansion. Uh, Oh, you know what? Uh, if, 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 If heaven's so big, why can't I have a spaceship, right? You think of all these things that you can never attain on earth and you're thinking, well, in heaven, I'm gonna have all those things, right? And we tend to think of heaven in ways that we're just gonna enrich ourselves even further. And as a result, it becomes kind of fairy tale and fantasy. And you can admit, maybe I just am more excited about what's going on in my life right now. But heaven is gonna be a place as we're gonna see this morning, that is beyond anything that we can experience, beyond anything that we can connect with, beyond any of our, what we can taste or sense. It's beyond words. We're gonna see some descriptions today of heaven, 
but we're going to see the Bible even struggles in describing the greatness of what we will experience in heaven. So as you're taking notes this morning, this is our main idea, and then we're going to unpack it some further here, is that heaven is way better than you can ever imagine. Heaven is way better than you can ever imagine. We are going to fail this morning to really articulate the greatness of what heaven is because it's that good. Heaven is way better than you can ever imagine. So let's try to define heaven. Wayne Grudem, the great theologian, he says this, heaven is a real place where God most fully makes his presence known. Let me say that again. Wayne Grudem says, heaven is a real place where God most fully makes his presence known. So as a result, we are to be heavenly minded over our earthly pursuits. We are to be heavenly connected and relate heavenly over the way that the world says that we should connect or relate with one another. In fact, we're told, Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 33, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. Heaven is going to be way better than you could ever imagine. So we're gonna look at a few things about heaven this morning. We're gonna see that you, are, that you will be made complete and satisfied, and then it demands a response, all right? Uh, you're gonna be satisfied, you're gonna be complete, and this can demand a response. Now, before we get into it, let's take a look where heaven is and the chart of history. Uh, in fact, if this is your first time uh, studying Revelation with us this morning, you can find all the other messages on our website at kenosha.church. Uh, but again, we've seen here, right now we are in the church age, all right? So if you take a look at the chart, we're at the church age. This is, the Bible calls it the last days. Uh, so this, this era has been going on for roughly 2,000 years. Sometime, and hopefully in our lifetime, uh, the church will be taken up into heaven, all right? And it will bypass what's called a tribulation phase of history. That is seven years of great judgment, a series of three of seven judgments, so it gives you uh, roughly 21 judgments uh, during a seven-year period that will be devastating to the earth. Many people will not uh, survive the seven-year tribulation, especially people that place their faith and trust in Jesus. Uh, they, will, they will be uh, martyred, most of them. Some will make it into then the millennial kingdom. So Jesus will, will render his judgment during the seven-year tribulation, and Jesus will reign physically on earth in a era of literally revival. You'll notice that the people that have the church that was raptured, taken up uh, with Christ to bypass the tribulation will join Christ during the millennium. During this time, people that survived the tribulation, they'll continue to have kids. That's important because at the end of the millennium, uh, Satan will be bound during the millennium, but at the end of the millennium, Satan will be let loose for a second. Those that do not know Christ will rebel in that second and they will be judged uh, very quickly. After the millennium, there'll be the judgment seats of which those that know Christ and don't know Christ will be separated. Those that don't know Christ will spend an eternity in a place called hell. We talked about that last week. A great lake of fire for, for forever, conscious punishment. And then finally, those that knew Christ will spend an eternity in the eternal state of what we often call heaven. I believe that today our idea of heaven is gonna be expanded. It's gonna go way beyond perhaps maybe you ever thought of heaven, okay? Uh, and so uh, the eternal state may be even a better name for, for heaven because as you'll see, there are different aspects of heaven. So do we understand this? History ends after the millennium and then it's a forever succession of moments uh, in the eternal state before Christ or those who are not in Christ in a place called hell, all right? So we see this in heaven. If heaven's way better than we can ever imagine, the reason being, number one is, is in heaven, you will be complete. In heaven, you will be complete. There'll be nothing lacking. Now you've heard the phrase, I've said this before, but you've heard the phrase, you complete me, right? Usually people in their dating, they're like, oh, you're so great, you complete me. You've been the one I've been looking for. Next day, why'd you dump me, right? And so... Or when you get married and, 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 you, and you, you say your vows and, and then you start living through life, you're like, you complete me, right? Oh, that phrase, you complete me. It's a cute phrase, isn't it? But do you think it's true? I wanna know out here, do you think that phrase, you complete me, is true? No? Does anybody say yes? Anybody brave, brave enough to say yes? 
No, it, you're right, no. It, it's a bogus phrase that is kind of hallmarky, right? The reason why it's not true is because people are broken. They're busted. And broken people can't make another broke person whole. They can help maybe in the healing process appointing them to the one who can make them whole, and that's Christ. But broke people can't make another broke person whole. And we're all broken people. So that phrase, you complete me, it's false. Cute in the moment, but it will never come out to be true. And so if you believe another person completes you, it's a surefire way of a, a broken codependency. Only Jesus can mend a broken heart. And by the way, I say this to every couple I, I do premarital counseling. I say this to, to every person I counsel. You will love better when you love Jesus first and when you love Jesus most. Amen? Now, we can be tempted to think if uh, we have certain possessions, maybe our 401k is rock solid, and some of you are like, oh, I hope it is, right? If you finally get that house, you're like, okay, housing prices, right? If I finally get that house, that car, man, everything I'm talking about right now is like just so inflated, right? Anyway, uh, and then the picket fence. You're like, you know, if I can just have that picket fence in front of my house, then I'll be satisfied. Or maybe it's that friendship group. I want you to go back to the midst of time right now. Can we do that? The midst of time to middle school, all right? To high school. And you're like, if only I can be in that friendship group. You know what I'm talking about? Those people that you just wanted to be a part of, the, the people that you dressed up like. Uh, you knew they're, who was in charge. There was always usually a king or queen. For me, in middle school, I wanted to be part of a certain group. But they wouldn't let me in, <laughs> right? You know, I'd be the last one to be called to hang I'd be the first one to be ridiculed. And I'm not saying this like, oh, woe is me. No, whatever, that's all our middle school experience, right? But then God gave me an aha moment in eighth grade. So I'm gonna give you some eighth grade wisdom here, right? <laughs> it was, why am I trying to impress these people? They make me miserable, right? And I realized in the moment, I was a follower of Christ, a young follower of Christ, I realized we are not in existence to please people. We exist to please God, right? And you know what? I said this is a middle school parable, right? This isn't a parable, it's a true story, right? I think sometimes as adults we forget that. We think that somehow that we need to fit in with certain people and that's the sum total of our, of our experience and what will bring satisfaction. But in reality, it's about are we going to be people that please God? And so for some of you, Back in the day, it was like, I ain't calling them. Why? Because I do all the calling. They never reach out to me. I ain't hanging out with them anymore. Why? Because I'm the one that always makes it happen. And the aha moment in eighth grade for me was this. Why am I keeping track? Why don't I just be the social butterfly? Right? Some of you think like, oh, Andy, you've always been crazy. I actually was more introverted before eighth grade. And in eighth grade, I had an aha moment. I realized, why don't I just make it happen? And when you become a social butterfly, right, you begin to not think of the different groups that the people are a part of. You just see them as people. And there's something that you can apply here when you become a follower of Christ. You see, the thing is, if you're a follower of Christ, you're called an ambassador of Christ. And you know what an ambassador does? The ambassador doesn't think of, oh, what people group is this part of, or, or, what, what, you know, or what's this person all aligned with? No, you represent Jesus Christ to everyone. For many of us, we need to find that freedom of who you are when you relate to people. You're an ambassador of Jesus instead of a beggar trying to get into a certain group. And that's why at Kenosha City Church, cliques have no place. Cliques have been banned. Cliques are banished. Because it's not about cliques. It's about you're an ambassador. And you're, you're an ambassador not only to the people in this room, you're an ambassador to the whole city of what Kenosha City Church has made a mission to. Because anyone and everyone, the Bible says, that says yes to the gospel of our Lord, is in. Let that sink in. That just seems scandalous, doesn't it? Oh, wait a minute. No. If they're a follower of Jesus Christ, guess what? They're in. Now, there may be people that say they're followers of Christ, and they're not followers of Christ. That's a different story. The point is this. 
is that you will not find your wholeness and completeness in Christ if you're trying to find it in something or somebody else. They don't complete you. And the point is, so many things will say they do complete you, and it's a lie. Only Jesus will complete you. And that is why we as a church, we love this core value and we love this phrase. We are not a perfect people, but people being made new. Amen, church? And in heaven, that promise will come to fullness. You will be made complete. So in heaven, you'll be made complete. Secondly, uh, in heaven, there will be a perfect dwelling place. The reason why that you are gonna be made complete is because you'll be living in a perfect dwelling place. Let's take a look at this. Revelation chapter 21, verse one. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband, all right? This is like a sci-fi movie, all right? It's like heaven's coming down, woo, right? Literally, it is. We see a new heaven and new earth as the first reality of the place. Uh, it, 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 we see the new heaven and new earth taking place of the reality of which we are experiencing today. We see the holy city of Jerusalem, which is also synonymous of heaven, all right? New heaven, new earth, uh, new Jerusalem. Just think of it under the umbrella of heaven, all right? Now, what is clear, just like hell, heaven is a real place and not just a concept. That's very important. It's popular today to people like, well, heaven's just a, a state of mind. No, it's a real place. Heaven is mentioned over 500 times in scripture. It's indeed a place where we should long for. It's a place that Paul mentions in the book of Philippians that is our true place of citizenship. We are living in a me-centered culture where our longings for the eternal state in heaven is often eclipsed by our temporary pursuits. We will spend an eternity somewhere and just as, heaven, or just as hell is a real place of punishment for those who would never place their faith in, in Jesus, heaven is a real place where followers of Christ uh, will spend an eternity in the presence of God. In secular thinking, heaven's that feel-good concept, but listen, the angels made very clear heaven is real. When Jesus ascended into heaven in Acts 1.11, uh, the angels spoke to the disciples, and they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Now, if heaven was in a real place, Acts 111 would read like this. They'd say, men of Galilee, do not worry. Jesus is going into bliss. And you will feel that bliss in your heart. And someday that bliss will manifest into further bliss, right? No, not at all. What we see here is Jesus going somewhere and he's coming back in the same way that he went that somewhere, and that somewhere's called heaven. It's a real place. Jesus was going to a real physical place. Jesus said in the Gospels that when in heaven, he's going to prepare a place for you. Heaven is waiting for you this morning. Heaven, in heaven, Jesus is preparing many dwelling places for you when this time ends. Now, word of caution. I've been talking about this morning how we need to long for heaven. It should not eclipse our, 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 our physical affections here on earth. But there's a word of caution on the other side of the spectrum. Just as much as we should long for heaven, I've met some people and followers of Christ who have become so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. What I mean by this is that uh, some people just, they wanna sit around and do nothing because they're like, I just want heaven, right? I just want heaven. And that's all they're thinking of is like, okay. And they, and they start diving in the book of Revelation. They start trying to figure out when Jesus is coming back. They start trying to figure out dates. They start reorienting their entire lives around that. I'm gonna tell you right now, that's disobedience. Heaven is a great motivator that we are to be ambassadors while we are on earth. We need to, have, we need to be heavenly minded so much so that we are effective while we're in our waiting room here called earth. So we see the phrase new heaven and new earth. New is not just something that's new as in chronological order, okay? It is, it's, it's after the experience we're having now, but it's something even deeper than that. In fact, the Greek word used for new shows us that it's something that we've never experienced before. It's something so amazing. In fact, we see a hint of this in Romans chapter eight, verse 18. It's uh, Paul telling the Roman church, he said, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed to us. 
For creation eagerly waits for the anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. For creation was subjected to fertility, and not willingly because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will also be set free from the bondage to decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. So what we see here, it's not only new, but it's recapturing the creation before it fell in the garden. You see what we're saying here? Is that this new creation isn't just an upgrade, it's something completely new, it's something completely perfect. The old is gone and the new has come. Now what is, you hear the phrase new heavens, new earth, what is the new earth? We, we barely talk about this, but we, sometimes we throw this out as just kind of a phrase. What is the new earth? Oh, are you ready to bend your mind a little bit, all right? Theologians debate this, but I believe that God uh, is going to restore the entire universe. The concept of heaven, new heavens, new earth, what we'll see today uh, is that God is going to restore the entire universe. Uh, It won't be the exact same earth. We we were told later on that the oceans will be absent. Uh, It'll be different uh, if if there is bodies of water because our bodies won't need water because they're glorified bodies that can't die. So whatever the new creation will look like, words can't describe it, but there will be a new earth. And we see here a new Jerusalem. This is not heaven itself, but the capital city of heaven that will come down and hover. And it'll be the dwelling place and throne of God. We'll talk more about the new Jerusalem in just a moment, but I I just want to talk about this whole concept of this new universe. John MacArthur speaks of the new Jerusalem this way. All of heaven is currently contained in the new Jerusalem. Okay, so New Jerusalem, later on in in chapter 21, they talk about the dimensions of the New Jerusalem. It's basically this giant cube that comes down over the renewed universe, all right? And right now, when someone dies, they go to be in the New Jerusalem, all right? That's heaven. But heaven, as we know it, will come down to hover. It'll continue to be the place of, of, of the throne of God. It'll be the place of where we dwell, but it will dwell over the new created of Uh, the new creation of the universe and earth. And so we see here all of heaven is currently contained in the new Jerusalem, John MacArthur says. It's separate from our present universe, which is tainted by sin. Believers who go to the heavenly Jerusalem uh, right now, where Jesus has gone before them to prepare a place for them. But when God creates the new heaven and new earth, the new Jerusalem will descend in the midst of the holy new universe and serve as the dwelling place of the redeemed for all eternity before the throne of God. All right, is our, is our idea of heaven kind of just getting broke here and, and expanded here? It's wild, isn't it? Heaven is the new universe. But our dwelling place will be in this cube-like fashion of the new Jerusalem before the throne of God. You know, there was a song in the 90s that said that we have a big, big yard where we can play football. Remember that? Anybody remember that in the church world, right? It's true. It's going to be huge. It's a perfect dwelling place, one where the throne of God is. That's the new Jerusalem over the new universe. Now, we will see that it's a perfect dwelling place. Secondly, there will be a perfect king, Revelation 21.3. Then heard a loud voice from the throne, look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and their God. Now, often when we think of heaven, we think of all the stuff and experiences that we can do uh, in heaven, right? Sometimes at the expense of the main event of heaven. The main event isn't that you can be Elon Musk and get a golden spaceship and go to the new universe and go to Mars, I think that's going to be stinking cool, by the way. I, 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 that's in the realm of possibilities. Oh, yeah, I went there. But here's the deal. Like, we can get so like, oh, I can't wait to do this. I can't wait to see my grandpa again. I can't wait to go visit all the planets in the solar system. It's like, eh, wrong. Yeah, that's kind of cool. But guess what? There's someone sitting on the throne, and that's the main event. We miss the point if we miss Jesus. One time, uh, I, I told you, Allison, she likes the beach. I like climbing a mountain. She likes the beach. And as I said, we have to kind of negotiate what our vacations are going to look like. And so the beach, all right? I just sit there. I'm like, all right, there's the water. What are we doing next, all right? So uh, it's, it's tough for me, all right? So, uh, but one time I surprised Allison. I'm like, we're going to go to the beach today, all right? And she says, where? And I thought it'd be really cool. Allison grew up for a time in Indiana, 
Uh, and she's moved all over, but she was uh, there for Indiana for a bit. And so I thought, you know what? How cool would it be for me to go take her to a, a, you know, Lake Michigan Beach on the southern end of Lake Michigan, Indiana? You barely think of that Indiana actually has Lake Michigan. How cool is that? So I'm like, all right, pl- just looked at the maps, like that beach looks good. We drove down to the beach. And as we were driving to the beach, I saw a sign say, welcome to Gary, Indiana. All right, now here's the deal. Nothing against Gary, Indiana, for those watching from Gary, Indiana. It's, I'm, it's a lovely place, I'm sure. But here's the deal. thought, huh, that's interesting. I didn't know this isn't Gary. All right. And I was like, you're taking me to Gary? I'm like, apparently. And so then we got to the beach. Now, if you know anything about Gary, Indiana, it's a very industrial city, right? And during this time, during the recession, a lot of the industry wasn't operational. So these, these rusted out factories. Well, we went to the beach. On our right and our left were these rusted out factories. There are even signs saying, don't go beyond this point. You could cut your foot, right? And so I was like, well, Allison, here's the beach. And she said, Andy, uh, thanks. <laughs> oh, boy. And she goes, Andy, let's not come back to this beach, all right? You know, when we're in heaven, you're free to move about the cabin. You can go all over the new heaven and new earth. Some of you are like, ah, oh, I can't wait. I wanted to take that Caribbean cruise. I'm finally going to be able to do it in heaven, all right? Some of you are already canceling your vacation plans. Like, hey, we're going to have a better one when we get to heaven. So why spend the money here when it's free in heaven? But here's the deal. If all you're enamored about is your stuff and experiences and places you can go at the expense of the throne, I got news for you. It's worse than a beach in Gary, Indiana next to a rusted out factory. Jesus is the main event, period. And the beautiful thing is this. You can begin to experience the beauty of what it's like to worship before the throne of God. It's called our praise time. It's called when we get lost in the word of God. Now, when you're in praise, there's sometimes you're distracted and you're like, oh, I didn't really do it for me. Well, it's not that God was off that morning and, and it was his fault. If, if we're not connecting with God in our prayer, the word, or, 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 or praise time, listen, it's not on God, it's that's on us, right? And, and it may be there's other things that God wants us to focus. I'm not saying that you have to look a certain way every time that you praise. But what I want to point you and bring you back to is this. If you ever had a moment in praise, uh, for followers of Christ, if you ever had a moment in praise where you just got lost in praise, you began to realize the manifest presence of God, you began to realize the worth of who God is, you realize how much he loves you and how much he cares for you and how much he's carrying your burdens, oh, remember that moment. Because that is just but a glimpse of what all of heaven's gonna be like when you're before the throne of God. I'm gonna tell you right now, when you experience just one moment before the throne of God in heaven, you're like, why would I wanna be anywhere else? And you can experience that moment now. As ambassadors of Christ, I want you to know this right now. Yes, we long to be before the throne of God. How could we not? But as ambassadors, we need to bring heaven down. In part, right now, rob hell, populate heaven, and experience the goodness of God in a broken world. Amen, church? You have bold access now. Now, in heaven, there will be a lot of people. The Bible says every tribe, tongue, and nation. How cool is that, right? But some of you are like, you've been to, you know, maybe you went to Disney World or Six Flags, and like, I hate crowds right? You can't stand them. How many people are there going to be in heaven? Like, what's the dimensions of this cube? Oh, there's going to be, I mean, it's every believer of all time that's ever placed their faith in, in Christ, right? Okay, so how many? I don't know, at least millions and millions, maybe billions, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. There's going to be a lot. And you're like, oh my goodness, seriously? This is, uh, maybe I will go travel to Mars, okay? Like, I, I don't want to be around people, Being in the presence of God around his throne isn't about going to a crowded event. There may be millions of people before his throne, but it's not gonna be maybe just maybe today I can get Jesus' autograph. Maybe today I can get a selfie with Jesus, right? It's not gonna be like that. Jesus isn't gonna be riding in the Pope mobile where you're like, okay, oh, Jesus gave me a blessing today. Hey, thanks, Jesus. Maybe I'll see you in, you know, well, we're in eternity, so maybe in eternity, right? I don't know. It's not gonna be like that. 
No matter how many people are around the throne of Jesus, Jesus is, is, is uh, he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, he's omnipresent. Uh, he will be able to give you and connect with you attention, even though he's doing it simultaneously with everybody in heaven. Does that make sense? I mean, it's happening right now. When we pray, and sometimes we, and here in church, I'm like, everybody lift up a prayer right now, and everybody's praying. Have you ever thought, man, how does God do it? Sitting on his throne and all these voices, Sometimes we have, have you all pray out loud at once and some of you are like, I just can't stand that. Why? It's like, I can't think. But guess who can do it? The Lord God Almighty on his throne. When millions and millions of people are praying at one time, we're not confusing God. He's giving you the personal connection. The Bible says that you can boldly approach the throne of God. Well, how are you gonna do it if there's a crowd? God's able to do it. He's able to take care of that. And in heaven, it'll be no different than what you see in part here on earth. You will be, be, be before the throne of God with millions upon millions of people, and yet you'll have that personal connection with God. It's amazing. You have bold access to God now, and you're gonna have even better access in heaven. In heaven, you'll be complete, perfect dwelling place, a perfect king, but we'll also see here a perfect body. Revelation chapter 21, verse four. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief and crying and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed. Then the one seated on the throne, Jesus said, look, I am making everything new. He also said, write this because these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. Our experience in heaven is gonna be so radically different than what we experience here on earth. And notice the difference. He will wipe away every tear. Now, it's not gonna be you're gonna enter in heaven like, oh, I'm hurt, I'm, I'm, I got this burden. No, 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 not at all. If there's tears in heaven, it's gonna be tears of joy, realizing what you're walking into. You realize that the burdens of regret, you realize that the burdens of, of, of discontent, you realize that, that the, the, the pains and the sorrows and the letdowns, uh, the things that weigh your heart down, down, they're gone. Now, I want you to know right now, if you're in Christ, positionally before Christ, those things are gone. They're gone. Uh, it, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus, your sins, those things that you regret in your past, they are thrown at the bottom of the ocean floor, never to be drudged back up. But I'm going to tell you, the human experience, though, still remembers it. The human experience still holds the scars and the burdens of life. And you ask God, God, I know that these don't represent me, but I still feel them. Are you with me? Like, why do I feel this? Well, in heaven, not only are you positionally forgiven, you will begin to feel in a glorified body. No longer do these things weigh you down or will they ever weigh you down ever again. Church, that demands a hallelujah, don't you think? When you place your faith and trust in Jesus, you are made new. You're made new. And death is gone. We've all been to a funeral, haven't we? I've been to some funerals where they, like one of my grandparents, they lived a really long time, all right? He broke the family record, okay? But you know what? Even at my grandpa, Harold McGowan's funeral, Almost made 94, which for the McGowan's, that's a, that's a record, I guess. All right? But it was still sad. Even though he knew Jesus, we still shed tears. Because every funeral, whether, it is, whether it's sudden or tragic in the sense that uh, they had a lot more life to live or whether they lived to be 110 years old, every person in a funeral, it's a great equalizer, say, it shouldn't be this way. Why does it have to be this way? I mean, if, if, if it was supposed to be this way, be like, well, yeah, that happens. Aren't you sad? Nah, right? I mean, if people do act that way, they're callous. They're callous to something, the reality that the wages of sin is death, that our physical bodies die because sin has corrupted this world. And, and worse yet, if we don't know Christ, we spiritually are dead. Funerals remind us of the pain of what it shouldn't be, but yet heaven restores God's original intent that death is no more, pain is no more. All these things have passed away. The noon has come. He has made all things new. And I love the reminder from Jesus. I will freely give to the thirsty the spring of the water of life. 
That means that anybody and everybody who places their faith and trust in Jesus will be made new. It reminds me of John 3, 16, where Jesus was telling Nicodemus in the dead of the night, when Nicodemus was like, how, one, how can one be saved? And Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever, everybody say whosoever with me, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Anybody, everybody who places their faith and trust in Jesus is not only going to be forgiven, but they're gonna be restored in heaven. Revelation 2, 21, verse six, Jesus is listed as the alpha and the omega, which means he's timeless, which means we can trust his promises. There's never been a time where God has not existed. Think about that for a second. I mean, we're blowing our minds away with heaven this morning, but God has never not existed. He's always been, he's always will be, which means God's bigger uh, than, your, than your life. He's bigger than your circumstances. He's bigger than the sum total of all of time. He hovers over time. In fact, heaven doesn't have time. Time is the measurement of decay. Uh, heaven is a succession of endless moments. And yet, the Alpha and the Omega he is bigger than the sum total of what's going on in our life. And he's gonna give you a perfect body. He's gonna take these things that you think are hopeless and he's gonna make them new. In heaven, you'll experience, another thing I wanna bring up is a perfect community. Revelation 21, verse seven. The one who conquers will inherit these things and I'll be his God and they will be my son. In heaven, we'll have a perfect community and there will be no sin. Uh, and as there's no sin, there will be a perfect harmony amongst the citizens of heaven. Uh, every person, a tribe, tongue, and nation will be represented in heaven. But I want us to look at uh, Revelation 21, 22. Let's jump ahead just a second here. Uh, Revelation uh, 21, 22, it says, I did not see a temple in it because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because the glory of God illuminates it and its lamp is the, uh, the lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring the glory into it. Its gates will never close by day because it will never be night there and they will bring glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does what is detestable or false but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. So we see here the reason why there's perfect community is that it is sin is, is not uh, in heaven all right, and anyone who didn't place their faith and trust in Jesus, that uh, their name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, they will be separated in a place called hell. So every tribe, tongue, nation will be represented in heaven for those who place their faith in Jesus. This is why Christianity is not just an American religion, it didn't even originate here, it originated in, you know, in Israel, right? Uh, it's not even a religion of the West, it's global, and that's why it's important that we need to be globally minded with the gospel. It's why in, in a week's time, we're gonna be sending out a team to South Africa uh, to go to, by the way, the biggest event they've done in Johannesburg with this organization to reach people all throughout South Africa. The reason why missions is important is because the gospel is global, and without the gospel, we have no hope. So this community in heaven will be devoid of relationship, breakdown, Selfishness, conspiracy, distortion of the word of God. God makes this very explicit why. In Revelation 21, 8, he says, but the cowards, the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, the sexual immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their share will be the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Now, this doesn't mean that those who have committed these sins are gonna be like, oh no, I'm going to hell, right? Uh, what it says is this, is that those who live a lifestyle like this, it really points to, if they say they know Christ, that maybe perhaps they don't know Christ. That's why today we have a very dangerous thinking that people think they can be followers of Christ, but live uh, whatever lifestyle they wanna live, all right? Uh, and, and so, uh, it, it's just simply not true. Uh, we need to be Jesus followers, not Jesus, so I can, you know, I get a get out of hell free card, right, person, right? We need to be followers of Christ. And heaven, heaven is way better than we can ever imagine, and I just give you some points there of why. Because in heaven, you'll be complete. But another thing about this, the reason why heaven's better than you can ever imagine is in heaven, you'll be satisfied. You'll be completely satisfied. You'll be complete, you'll be satisfied. 
one of the descriptions we see here, and it's just mind-blowing, is the beauty of heaven. Revelation 21, 12, it says, The city had a massive wall with 12 gates. Twelve angels were at the gates. The names of the 12 tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. They were, so they're talking about the New Jerusalem here. Uh, there were three gates in the east, three gates in the north, three gates in the south, three gates in the west. The city had 12 foundations and 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb were on the foundations. Uh, so what we'll see here uh, is that the beauty of heaven is unimaginable. The new Jerusalem indeed has dimensions. We see this in verse 15. Uh, we see 144 cubits, according to human measurement, 12,000 uh, stata. Uh, it's linked width and height are equal. So we see it's a cube. It's, it's very, very large. Uh, in fact, uh, the theologian Henry Morris said, the cube-shaped city is perfect for us because the new bodies of the resurrection saints will be like those of angels, no longer limited by gravitational or electromagnetic forces. Wait a minute here. You know what this theologian, and this is, by the way, a reputable theologian. You know what this theologian is saying? It's a cube. We're not held by the gravitational forces by Earth. Oh, yeah. Fly like an eagle over me. Right? I think he's saying we can fly. All right, now that's speculative. I don't know. What, but I, I, I'll believe it. I'm down, right? Hey, see me in my mansion. Where's that? It's up. Fly right there. It's going to be amazing. 21 verse 19, the foundations of the city wall were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first foundation is jasper, the second sapphire, the third uh, chelisandi, <laughs> uh, the fourth emerald, the fourth uh, sardinex, you know, all these things, you know, that uh, we have in our house, not really. All right, the uh, carnelian, seventh, okay, you get the point. I don't even know these stones, all right? And so <laughs> they're expensive. The 12 gates, verse 21, are the 12 pearls, and such the individual gate was made of a single pearl. And the main street of the city was pure gold. There it is. You think that was like fantasy? It's like, oh, the streets of heaven are gold. Like, there it is. The most expensive thing that we love in this world is but pavement in heaven. And with this beauty, it reminds us, man, they're just struggling. to Remember, John's seen a vision of heaven. He's really, really, really struggling the beauty of what heaven is going to look like. It's going to be beautiful. But with the beauty of heaven and knowing that we get to be in front of the throne of God, it reminds us of the urgency we have right now on earth. In Luke chapter 16, 19, Jesus tells a story of a rich man and a poor guy named Lazarus. Now, this was just a story, uh, but he wanted to demonstrate the urgency that we have with the reality of heaven and hell. Luke 16, 19, there was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, fasting lavishly every day. But the poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, was lying at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table, but instead the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day the poor man died and was carried away by the angels uh, to Abraham's side, and the rich man also died and was buried. What's interesting from this story, a lot of times people focus on the disparity between the rich man and the, and the, uh, 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 and the poor man named Lazarus, but I, I think they're missing the point when they look at the disparity of him being rich and him being poor. I think what's really important here is no matter who you are, death is the great equalizer. It is appointed once for a person to die, and then they stand before the Lord for judgment. So death is a great equalizer. It doesn't care about how, how much you have, what your name is, what your last name is, what your prominence is in a city, uh, or who, who knows your name. Uh, death is the great equalizer no matter what. And death is certain this side of heaven. Death is constant. In fact, studies have shown constantly the death rate in this room is one out of one, unless Jesus comes back. The only exception, again, if Jesus comes back, but we will all face God no matter if he comes back in our lifetime or we die and go before him. Death came to the poor man Lazarus and the rich man alike. And we notice that the rich man went to a place called hell and we see the uh, poor man went to Abraham's side which is synonymous with heaven. When you see Abraham's side, uh, people in the Old Testament culture, they believe that when he died, the best place to be would be right next to Abraham, all right? So Abraham's side was another name for heaven and Jesus is using that terminology because the Jewish people would understand it. So the rich man, he placed a too high of a value on secondary things in this life. He missed the most important thing, and that is a relationship with Jesus. The poor man, he didn't miss that. We live in a society where the secondary has become the primary. We want it now with little cost, 
We want weddings, but no marriage, no commitment. We want a job, but with all the vacation days and, and no responsibility. We want the house without the payments. We want a culture that, that wants accolades with life without struggle. We want success without the sacrifice. We want it all without it all. And here's the deal. If you don't believe now on earth, you will believe in eternity. But if you wait to believe until eternity, as we'll see in this parable, it's too late. Verse 23 of this parable, and being in the torment in Hades, the rich man, he looked up and he saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. He said, Father Abraham, he called out, have mercy on me and send me Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I'm in agony in this flame. Son, Abraham said, remember that during your life you received good things just as Lazarus received bad things. But now he's comforted here while you're in agony. Besides all this, a great chasm has been fixed between us and you so that those who want to pass over from here to you cannot and neither can those from there cross over to us. The rich man responded, Father, he said, then I beg you, send to him to my father's house because I have five brothers. Warn them so that they will not also come to this place of judgment. It's the reason why at every funeral I said, and I will say, if such and such could be back here today, I'm confident that they would say, you need to know Jesus. This parable serves as a warning for us today who are still alive. There is still time to be an ambassador, and if you don't know Christ, there's still time to receive Jesus Christ as Savior. It's time for us to wake up. And when we're awake, you realize there's still time and there's still hope and hope to be given away because without Jesus, there is no hope. And when you stand before Jesus and you haven't made him savior, there's a great chasm you can never cross. But you wanna know something that should burn hotter than, than the flames of hell this morning? The gospel should burn hotter in our hearts this morning as followers of Christ. The gospel should be not just contained and hidden, it, it, should be, it should explode out. When hope is unleashed through you, the greatest miracle of the living, life-giving message of Jesus is unleashed. The message of Jesus brings life and forgiveness. The message cannot and should not stay inside. The forward motion of Jesus, it changes you to be more like you. It's changing the people of God uh, in, in this place, but it needs to be given out to those who don't know Jesus. So what will you do? Heaven's a great motivator to be a great ambassador while we wait for heaven. Heaven is a great motivator for us to realize if you don't know Jesus, today the Bible says, today is the day of your salvation. So my, I have some questions for us this morning. The first thing is this. You can't talk about heaven without giving an invitation for those to receive Jesus in heaven, right? If you don't know Jesus, you either know that you've never placed your faith and trust in him or you're uncertain. Let's just put it this way. If you were to stand before the Lord God Almighty and he said, why should I let you in? And you're like, I don't know. Or you're like, I don't know if I have that confidence. You can have the confidence today. You can know that you're a child of God and been forgiven today. In fact, I'm gonna give you that opportunity right now. If you wanna know Jesus Christ, you wanna receive him in your life, you want him to forgive you of all your sins, past, present, and future, if you wanna be a citizen of heaven, I'm gonna give you the opportunity right now, no matter your past, no matter what's going on in your life right now, he's bigger than that, he'll receive you right now. Let's bow our heads, let's close our eyes. Lord Jesus, we need you. I pray for anybody in this room right now that doesn't know you as Savior, that right now they receive you. In fact, as we continue to pray with every head bowed and eyes closed, just creating a place of privacy here. If today you are uncertain or you know you need to get right with Jesus, you need to receive him into your life, you wanna receive him as your personal savior. You wanna place your full faith and trust that he died on the cross to save you from your sins, that he rose from the dead. You're like, Jesus, I need you right now. I'm placing my faith and trust in you right now. And the count of three, if that's you, no one looking around, will you just slip up your hand? One, two, three, raise your hand right now, that's me. I wanna place my faith, awesome, I see you. Awesome, just raise that hand up high. Some of you are already responding right now, that's awesome. That's awesome, anybody else? Like, man, I don't know what I'd say if I'd stand before Jesus. But today, guess what? You receive him, it's not about what you say. <laughs> you know, he already knows who you are. 
Anybody else want to receive Jesus today? Just raise up your hand up high. Nobody else is seeing, no one's looking around. Awesome. Well, let's pray together as a church because some people in this room are responding right now. Let's just pray as a church together. I'm gonna help you pray. This prayer doesn't save you. I'm just helping you communicate to Jesus. He's the one that saves you, all right? So let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I realize I've done wrong in my life. I realize I've sinned and I need your forgiveness. Thank you for dying on the cross, saving me from my sins. Thank you for raising from the dead, defeating death. Thank you for making me new. Help me follow you now. In Jesus' name, amen. As a church, it is our honor to be a small part in all that God is doing in and through your life. And we would love to continue with you on that journey. To find out more about what your next steps can be at Kenosha City Church, all you have to do is go to kenosha.church slash next steps. Thanks again for joining us today.